This is an ABC podcast. And Giuseppe and the ancient broadcaster welcome you to another episode of uh, LNL. On the show tonight, I'm going to introduce you to Richard Norton Taylor. He's a journo who's been covering security issues in the UK for, well, damn near half a century, during a period then when Whitehall has got more and more secretive, and later a special Easter treat, something from the archives to make us all feel a little happy, an interview with the great and sadly missed John Clark. But first, uh, I want to introduce you, uh, beloved listeners, to uh, one of the most respected British defence and security journalists of his generation, Uh, Richard Norton Taylor is his name, and he's been described as a long-term thorn in the side of uh, the intelligence establishment, which I'm sure is a a charge he carries proudly. He's the author of a new book, not an autobiography, but an account of Whitehall, its ancient customs and rituals, and the operation, culture and exploits of Britain's security and intelligence over the, well, the last 50 years. He joined The Guardian in 73 as the newspaper's first European correspondent, based in Brussels, returned to the UK in 75, tasked with combating official secrecy in Whitehall and scrutinising the activities of the security and intelligence agencies and in that capacity won a whole host of awards. His new book is called The State of Secrecy, Spies and the Media in Britain, published by Taurus, and Richard, it's a delight to welcome you to our little wireless program. I'm very glad to be here, thank you. Now, I, uh, you of course were absolutely destined to be, um, well, for MI5 to try and recruit you because you came from a distinguished military family, you went to Oxford, you attended King's School, Canterbury, where everyone from Christopher Marlowe playwright and spy, and Somerset Maugham attended, and you're then summoned to an interview at MI5. Can we come with you? Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. Well, I was MI6, actually, not MI5. MI6 is Britain's Foreign Intelligence Services, the nearest thing to James Bond. They, they, uh, they, they work abroad to try and uh, seduce uh, uh, spies and get secrets from from hostile countries and so on. That's MI6. MI5 is a domestic security service. I think in Australia you only have one, don't you? Anyway, we have two. So MI6 was uh, trying to recruit me partly because I got a very bad degree at Oxford University, a third class, which is actually quite difficult to get. Or as a former member of MI6, uh, also got a, a close friend of Kim Philby, actually, uh, also got a third class degree, and uh, he described it as a triumph over the examiners. Well, anyway... The point about my third class and bad degrees, because I didn't do much work really, is because the, uh, I think MI6, the Foreign Intelligence, uh, Secret Intelligence Services of Britain, wanted someone with not an academic intelligence, but sort of what someone who got around the place a kind of, a different kind of intelligence. Anyway, I was summoned by a secret telegram in the mid-60s, yes, right. And um, they asked me a various question, would I like to join the... The uh, Britain's Secret Intelligence Service, I said, um, I thought about it actually a bit. I was about uh, 18, 19 at the time. Didn't know what to do. But then by chance, someone said, let's go to this place called the College of Europe, a postgraduate place. Britain was about to join what we then called the common market, later the European Union. Um, Something that, of course, the Australians didn't like very much, or New Zealanders either, for that matter, because of the effect on their trade in sugar and stuff. Britain would join this protectionist European Union. Uh, U- European outfit, which was in Brussels, and that's when I started my journalism um, in Brussels. I mean, joined, having finished with the College of Europe, this sort of postgraduate institute for a, a year, I then became a freelance journalist in Brussels, which is a paradise, paradise for journalists, really, for various reasons, including the fact we didn't have to rely on British officials telling you stuff all the time. You know, permanent negotiations between lots of different countries including the Irish, I have to say. The Irish joined the common market at the same time as Britain did, and they 
they, they, uh, they, the, the kind of years and years of resentment being under the hock of the British, uh, economically and politically, they started leaking all sorts of embarrassing stories <laughs> about Britain, which was wonderful for me. That's how I started my journalism, anyway. I, I want to go back to that uh, that initial meeting for just a moment. Yes. Because I found yeah. it fascinating that you you're told don't tell anyone you've come here, don't discuss our meeting with anyone outside, don't call us, we'll call you, and you got a second interview. Yes, I did. Um, they obviously thought uh, I was uh, a potential material. Um, I was sort of polite, I suppose, and I was I, st I talked okay, really, I suppose, with a kind of decent enough accent. <laughs> anyway, the, the second interview, they asked me a couple of questions. The one question was, what do you think, uh, should the then Labour government have sent in British troops to quell a UDI's Rhodesian Rebellion? People may remember the, the, the unilateral uh, uh, Declaration of Independence by uh, Ian Smith. They asked me that question because I thought, why are they asking me that question? why Britain didn't send troops to quell that rebellion. Kith and kin and all that stuff. And I, I said that they should have done, because uh, if, if the British sent troops there, the white Rhodesian police would not have wanted to shoot dead or attack the incoming British, their kith and kin. Anyway, uh, that was a good answer. And uh, they thought that was a good answer, I think, because MI6 had said, go in there with the troops. So I was on there, uh, and, the, and of course the Labour government said no. Um, Harold Wilson said no. So I was on, on, on their wavelength, I suppose. So they, 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 um, they, and they continued to try and contact me with, with letters and so on. That was after my second interview. So I, get, I guess I was, uh, I was sort of potentially, potentially a spy for Britain. I was approached by ASIO, our, uh, oh, yes, our, I know our that. agency, when I was a teenage communist. In the uh, in the early sixties, and they wanted they wanted to recruit me, and uh, I finally got my file only quite recently, and I discovered, although it was heavily redacted, that they yes. decided I wasn't suitable because they thought I might be mentally unstable. Not a very <laughs> flattering, but absolutely accurate. I you know I must add. That's pretty good. Okay. In almost well, fifty years in journalism, you have observed this trajectory of intelligence institutions that were already deeply secretive, but of course their powers have now been turbocharged. Does this alarm you? Uh, their powers have been turbocharged and they haven't, they've, all the, they, they, they've got a, an element, a new kind of um, or newish kind of accountability scrutiny procedures a kind of parliamentary committee which is not very effective, but um, and, and the point is, the real point about your, your case, they, they, their powers have been turbocharged for obvious reasons, were terrorism really for, against, uh, against Islamist extremism and all that, jihadists, and we've had some attacks in Britain. Um, and uh, that really was, uh, and the other, the other thing which worried me is because most, the, the British people, including members of parliament, are quite deferential. I mean, they, they reckon that we've, you know, we've never been occupied and so on, the, the power of the states of power for good and all that stuff nuclear weapons, everything else. And the British are really quite deferential, as Australians probably know, um, as I found out in the spy catcher case in Sydney in the mid-80s. So that's another story. Anyway, um, and so they, 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 their powers have, the Secretary and Intelligence Agencies have, have uh, increased powers. And the law cannot keep up with those powers. As even, um, well, even Google and those other sort of tech companies tease the governments of the West and British government saying you cannot keep up with what we can do with our new uh, surveillance technology and uh, what some people call uh, surveillance uh, capitalism and all that stuff and um, and laws cannot keep up with them the powers they have the MPs try to some MPs try to and most MPs don't in Britain but I said there's MPs on a committee called the Intelligence Security Committee which meets in private and so that worries me and um, and very few journalists, uh, let alone MPs, uh, are willing to uh, tease out or criticise or question the activities of the security intelligence agencies in Britain, MI5 and MI6. And GCHQ, of course, which is the big, uh, one of the big um, five eyes uh, signals intelligence outfits to intercept uh, in messages around the world. And Australia is a member of that with uh, the Pine Gap based apart from anything else, in the middle of the desert, isn't it, somewhere? Anyway, for all those <laughs> reasons, uh, um, we're concerned uh, 
I'm concerned about the, um, what the security intelligence agents can get away with without us knowing. I'm talking to uh, Richard Norton Taylor, and dear listener, you can only eavesdrop on our conversation if you have the appropriate security clearance. Now, after <laughs> decades of scrutiny, you say you've got the measure of the agencies, and you believe they must be taken down from their pedestal. Yeah. Why? And surely this would mean they would be dragged, kicking and screaming. Well, they should be taken down by the pedestal. They're treated by, uh, as I say, by a lot of most MPs and by most journalists, actually, as a kind of exotic breed. They cannot be questioned. They're on a kind of pedestal, on an altar, if you like. And uh, you've got to be quite um, you've got to be persistent and, 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 and be willing to be very unpopular amongst your own journalist colleagues here in Britain, as well as uh, members of Parliament, let alone ministers and government officials and they've also they've got to look at their record their, their record is not great um for example they never predicted they they're meant to look ahead but they everything came to all the big events came as a great surprise i think to mi6 certainly and mi5 the british security intelligence agencies what came as a surprise they were surprised by the invasion of czechoslovakia by the soviet forces in 68 by the fall of the berlin wall in 89 by the Arab Spring of 2011, the annexation of uh, Crimea by Putin's Russia, all those things came as a great surprise. And uh, so then comes the question of what are they, what act, can they actually help? They say, you know, we've got to be secretive to allow us to protect uh, public uh, safety and national security and so on. But have they done it? And they, you know, their record is not great. That's what I say. It was a huge culture shock when you found that language was the biggest weapon in uh, Whitehall's arsenal, the yeah. manipulation and clever use of uh, the well-chosen phrase. And I quote, I look back unsettled at the amount of times I was lied to. Whitehall officials would not use the word, of course. Churchill, be, who became a past master at the art, famously used the phrase terminological inexactitude. I love the phrase. I didn't realise it was Winston's. Yeah, that, that, well, he was the first person who used it publicly. He may have got it off someone else. And there's another great phrase, uh, of course, which is called economical with the truth which was uh, used by uh, the Cabinet Secretary, Mrs Thatcher's Cabinet Secretary, in the spy catcher trial in Sydney in the mid-80s. Uh, that's the tri trial where the British government tried to stop this former MI5 officer, Peter Wright, living in Tasmania at the time, but uh, his publisher was Heinemann of Australia, based in Sydney. He wanted to publish his memoir. The British government said, no, he can't. It's bound by a lifelong duty of confidentiality and uh, but the, 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 the phrase economical with the truth came out by Lord Armstrong, Sir Robert, as he then was Thatcher's cabinet secretary, because he asked, he, he tried to stop the, a book previously published by Chapman Pincher, a journalist called Their Trade is Treachery about alleged Soviet penetration of the British uh, security service MI5. And uh, so Malcolm Turnbull, who was then the defender of Peter Wright, uh, wanted to publish his book, said, um, well, well, you didn't have to ask, ask for that book because you already seen the manuscript uh, from the publishers. So Armstrong uh, said, yes, he did. And then there's a great uh, discussion about what kind of truth. Is it a bent truth? As Malcolm Turnbull said, if it's not a direct lie, what kind of lie? And um, <laughs> he ends up by saying I was economical with the truth. Now, People in Whitehall, they talk about, I don't know about Australian uh, officials, they talk about not, not direct lies, and they talk, they talk into a view from it, and they never commit themselves. They, they say, no, I hear what you say, they say, or everything we've done on a case-by-case -case basis, or I don't recognize those figures. And they also, they use euphemisms. Really. Uh, George Orwell, I think, observed once, he said in, in one of his essays, pol in politics and war, and business indeed, uh, euphemisms are instruments that make lies sound truthful and murder respectable. <laughs> so that is what um, I think uh, the, the Whitehall uh, officials, and maybe Australian officials too, uh, are, are, are past masters at the art of not telling direct lies, but uh, as, as, as an enormous Iraq inquiry we had in Britain in the, in the 90s, um, the uh, officials in Whitehall talked about uh, uh, half the picture can be true, and truth is a very difficult concept. All that stuff comes out.
Um, as, as, uh, as I'm sure yeah. you're aware, young Malcolm Turnbull went on yes. to become a fairly ineffectual Prime Minister. And by yes. eerie coincidence, his new book, his political autobiography, is out yes. this very week. And because of, uh -huh. the, of the virus, he can't do the book tour. So... Uh -huh. um, Tony Blair, yes. of course, his Freedom of Information Act introduced in 2000 yes. didn't help journalists, did, did it? It, it? It didn't help journalists because there were so many exemptions. And um, the, uh, it was very difficult to when the government said, no, we can't release that information because of national security or some vague uh, phrase like that. Uh, it took a lot of time to go to... They had a procedure where they, you could ask the government department involved, Minister of Defence, say, or the Home Office here, for, for the information to be released, and then it would go through an internal uh, procedure and uh, scrutiny, and then if you disagreed with that, you'd go to an, an outside information commissioner. It would take a long, long time. And, of course, Whitehall hoped by that time the journalist uh, would be uh, impatient and drop the case anyway. Um, Blair, of course, said in his own biography uh, called A Journey that, uh, looking back, he said the Freedom of Information Act was the worst possible thing he'd ever done. He said, why did I do it? I must have been mad, he, he said, virtually said that. I'm and, glad uh, he admits to error. Well, he, he did on that thing, because well, in a rather self-serving way. Of course the journalists are going to use that act anyway. The, the thing called the Public Records Act here in Britain, where um, it's meant to open up uh, government archives. We had a sort of 30-year rule, which is a convention where, you know, now it's going back to, uh, down to 20 years, where by almost automatically all records, uh, or all records of government departments cannot be uh, released for at least 20 years after they were first um, written up. Now, there's so many exemptions in that, and one, uh, one famous section, I call it Section 3, Brackets 4, one of my favourite sections of a statute in Britain under the Public Records Act says that... Uh, Whitehall officials can keep back any records for administrative or any other special reason without saying what other special reason can be political embarrassment or anything. So that, that's uh, sort of a, a, a record sort of randomly selected. So history becomes a secret too. History is censored, I'd say, as much as contemporary activities of the spooks. Yeah. In your time as a young reporter, Whitehall, a bastion of privilege, but you make the point it wasn't based on class or money. It was a club whose doors were firmly locked from the inside by people you describe as the mandarins of the permanent government who yeah. pay homage to, the, to parliamentary democracy but don't really respect it. Well, that's right. They don't respect it because, well, quite explicitly... And privately, of course, to me, they've said, maybe over a drink or so, how they um, they uh, patronise MPs and don't, of course, um, give them as much information as I say MPs need. And certainly MPs are mostly deferential, so they go along with this. There was, there was a former um, senior Whitehall man, a good man, actually, I like him a lot, called Sir Patrick Nairn, a senior Minister of Defence official here in Britain, who uh, said in one uh, in a remarkable uh, example of intellectual honesty, probably, he said he went, he said the secrecy culture of Whitehall is essentially a product of British parliamentary democracy. Economy with the truth is the essence of a professional reply to a parliamentary answer. And the amount of time the officials take to answer a parliamentary question, so they don't uh, commit a direct lie, but uh, they, they give out as, as little information as possible. Reading your text again and again, one is reminded of uh, Sir Humphrey in Yes Minister. Yes, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, um, which is very clever stuff and very popular stuff. I think it's coming back here. Uh, one of the writers, Jonathan uh, Lyon, is going to come up with a new series on that for British television. Um, because it does show how officials, i.e. members of the permanent government, can with their sort of intellectual ability or maybe not ability so much elasticity and... Uh, wonderful uh, way they can choose words and baffle and convince uh, a minister who of course ministers come and go don't know about australia but here they're often a minister in the last few years they've been a minister for a few months well we jobs. we have that view of prime ministers as you know richard so yes yes they have the shelf life of yogurt 
Well, exactly, yeah. That's right. So, of course, the permanent government, now the officials, can tell ministers, don't worry, I wouldn't do that. And you remember the other, last, uh, your predecessor got in trouble by saying something which you're about to, you, you want to say yourself. I'd keep quiet if you were, if I were your minister. All that kind of stuff, yes. And, and the minister, of course, doesn't want to get information either, so that the, which, which you'll be tempted or have to reveal to MPs when they ask questions in Parliament, for example. Another weapon in the Whitehall arsenal is, of course, the use of delay, plus well-timed yes. leaks, flying yes. kites to divert yes. attention. And you described the Chilcot inquiry into the invasion of Iraq yes. as a striking example of using delay. That, that took about... Uh, to, uh, it, was, it was getting on for, well, eight years in the end. Tony Blair didn't want it. The Americans had uh, their own... Um, U.S. Congress uh, inquiries, much, much more opening and, and uh, deeper, profound inquiries into the invasion of Iraq. Well, the new prime minister then, Gordon Brown, said, uh, first he said the inquiry should be, because Whitehall told him to say this, should be secret. But then enough people by that time, even MPs, were so concerned about uh, how we were dragged into this invasion of Iraq, uh, said, no, it's got to be public, it's got to be public. So it became a public inquiry. But the people who had the last word on what information and what uh, it could be, and what documents it's, uh, this inquiry should be given, uh, was Whitehall. Whitehall could have a veto. So what happened was that for years and years and years, the then Cabinet Secretary, he prevented, he delayed the, the um, release of documents which the inquiry wanted, the Shokon inquiry wanted, and of course this inquiry went on and on and on and on. And finally, it, it was ready. It was ready, actually, just about the time of the EU referendum here in Britain in June 2016. And um, it was published, the Chilcot inquiry into the invasion of Iraq, about uh, two weeks later, when, of course, everyone was uh, diverted attention away from. So that Chilcot inquiry got lost. And it was a very important inquiry. It really is. It's worth you know, rereading, I say, to British people here. It's very, quite, quite long. There's a great summary. There are lessons to be learned there, and tremendous lessons. And it really put the boot into... MI6, the security, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Service, for well, misleading. That, let, let's just dwell on that a second, because as yes. Sir Humphrey was forever advising a uh, hacker, if, you, yes. if you're forced to have an inquiry, you put your own bloke in charge of it and, uh, you know, yes. he'll sweep things under the carpet or, yes. or simply delay. And Chilcot, of course, was one of uh, Whitehall's own. But as you point out, yes. he wasn't such a pushover. Well, he wasn't. He was. We, a lot of people said Whitehall's owner. He was the permanent secretary of the Department of Northern Ireland. He was, you know, bound up in the ethos of official secrecy and all that stuff. But actually, I think because it was his last, it's probably his last public job. He had a sort of credibility. He wanted to go down in history, not as a kind of self-censored uh, figure of the establishment. And I think he did a sort of cue shift, as it were. I mean, he did. Uh, he did say to himself, "I've got to be. T I'd be tougher on this, so I'd be applauded by the." public and he did fight his corner um on especially on for example uh, what had never been published before and that is uh, a british prime minister's notes conversations of his notes of of a private telephone conversations with an american president now there's a big fight that's one of the causes of the delay and finally chilcott got half got a bit of his way and anyway it was unprecedented that the chilcott report does publish phrases and the gist as they call it yeah, the gist of um, Blair's conversations with President George Bush, and they were quite they were quite revealing um, because they show that uh, you know Blair basically, in, in one notorious phrase, when I'll be with you, whatever, was one of the things. So you know, basically, he didn't tell the British public that Blair, but he basically said to George Bush privately, whatever you do, invading Iraq, whenever you want to do it, well, the British will be, or well, my government will be with you. So these things came out, and they were seriously embarrassing for, for Blair, of course, and his reputation has, um, didn't survive that. Uh, Blair will go down in history for a lot of things. I mean, a good thing in Northern Ireland, peace and so on, but a really bad thing on the invasion of Iraq, partly because the legacy is there with us. We're almost out of time, and I want to end yeah. by heading off in a completely different direction. An aspect yes. of your career I find absolutely fascinating. I should point, I don't know if I mentioned it when introducing you, yes. but beloved listeners, Richard is also a playwright. 
Now, many great playwrights like Arthur Miller, who was once on this program, will seek out a political theme. But what you do is you turn your political insights into plays. Is that because yeah. you find right. conventional journalism in, inadequate for your uh, requirements? Well, when I, when I made it into plays, I, I use a theatre on a different platform, really. And it started off because if you're writing about long, I say, trials and, uh, and scandals, uh, which have uh, the object of, of public inquiries, which go on for weeks and weeks and months and months, and then uh, but the news editors of uh, papers get bored. Say, this is not new, and it's not new anymore. We've had all this. So, and also the public doesn't actually get a hold of it. They don't understand. They get bored as well. So what is better than putting it all together in a sort of three-hour play in a theater, a live audience? Much better to explain, even though there's, there's no sort of drama, there's no sort of surprise ending and so on, in that sense, no conventional drama. But people, and there's a tremendous residual interest in that. I did, for, one was on a uh, play was on the, called The Color of Justice on the, uh, the murder of a black uh, teenager called Stephen Lawrence. Um, who was, was killed by racist uh, people in South London. Another was on Bloody Sunday, which, which was a 10-year inquiry under a guy called, a judge called Lord Saddle. And, and I put it into three hours, which you can do that, um, because it was one incident, of course, Bloody Sunday in Derry in 1972, where civil rights march, uh, marchers were, were shot and killed by the British Army. Anyway, the point is, I thought that theatre was a great platform for a frustrated journalist like I was, when you can't get your stories out in a newspaper where all the news editors, as I said, had butterfly minds and they didn't want to pursue a story which had uh, lasted more than a few uh, days, I say, maybe a few weeks, anyway. Um, so that was why I used the theatre. Well, you also use radio quite well, as our conversation demonstrates, and it's been marvellous to talk to you. My guest has been Richard Norton Taylor, award-winning journalist. His new book is a memoir of his work over the past 50 years called The State of Secrecy, Spies in the Media in Britain, published by I.B. Taurus. Thanks very much, Richard. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Up next, a special something from the archives, an interview with John Clark from 2008. to talk to John Clark but we haven't turned his headphones on yet and or his microphone so I can have a bit of a chat to you the listener before we do so now I've been talking to Clarkie on the program for Yonks April 1997 was the first and then in December 2003 we've talked about all sorts of things his you know nice soft puffy interviews things like his debut appearance and Barry McKenzie his uh, cultural affinities with John Betjeman, W.A. Jordan, all sorts of stuff, but no more Mr. Nice Guy. I am going to rip into him tonight. No, he, he's got no idea what's coming up, but, you know, I think I think it's time he's confronted with his shortcomings instead of you know, this angel, endless adulation for his, his alleged genius. Now, I'm, you know, this is my issue, this is my issue. There's a new book out. It's called The Catastrophe Continues, 21 Years of Interviews, and it's Clark and Dorr on the front here. And it's got the texts of so many of the interviews that have gone on to the 7.30 report with Hawkey, Bajelke, Peterson, Thatcher, Peacock, John Elliott, Hewson, Button, David Hill, Alan Bond, etc. etc. Bronwyn Bishop, hundreds of them, hundreds of them, Philip Ruddick, Kevin Rudd. But I don't know if you've noticed, but he makes no effort. They're all the same. They are all bloody well identical. Does he wear prosthetic noses? Do we? No, he doesn't. Does he whack a wig on? Not the slightest effort, and I don't think we're getting out. Our money's worth our six cents a day, so I'm going to sink the slipper. Good evening, John. How are you? Hang on, I'm just trying to put these headphones on. <coughs> Philip, sorry, where were you? I'm, no, I'm just saying, good evening, John. How are good you? Good evening. You're well? Not terribly. What about Excellent. you? You mentioned value for money. Can I can I um, 
require a further and better definition of money. John, why is it that you don't try when you're doing these interviews? Why don't you lift your game a bit and, you know, and create a variety of theatrical characters? Why is it that you just sit there for 21 well, the, years being the you? ABC, the ABC, as well you know, Philip, used to have a, a deeply enriched wardrobe department, but they've shut it and they've taken the frock to Sydney. So there's it's very little we that. can do. We make do with what we can. It's a minimalist exercise by virtue of necessity. I remember, I remember you were always a bit uneasy about dressing up. You fled, you fled from New Zealand really because you became <laughs> super famous after your um, Fred Dagg thing. And even when you were doing the Gillies report, God, that's ages and ages ago, during the Hawke government, you, mm. you, you know, there's, there's, there's the star, the other star, going to no end of trouble to give vocal and physical facsimiles of Hawk or Diamond Jim McClelland, and you just sit there on the screen doing nothing. Now, you, you started to put wigs on. Uh, do you remember that? You started... I then... did. I started to put wigs on because I was balding and I was actually presenting a lighting problem. So I said, I'm going to put a wig on, but not for reasons of vanity. So I'll consent to do it if and only if I can put a bigger one on each week and it will become <laughs> the program's plot. And you finished up looking like Bronwyn Bishop, didn't you? I did, yes, yeah. an idea that she seized from me. <laughs> I must admit... But that, of course, was one of the reasons that that program was such a creative um, success and a wonderful program to work on was precisely the mixture of various different things and various different elements. That was a pretty remarkable group of people, that. Yes, we, and... Uh, oh, well, I, I loved every minute of it. I sent you an email a couple of weeks ago, actually, of, uh, saying thank you because I happened upon on cable, a complete replay of the games. Oh, yes. And, and I just sat there and was paralytic. For, uh, wonderful, wonderful thing. That was no, well, that was a terrific project to work on. That was a, a wonderful collaboration, and that was nice because you could pretend that you weren't trying to be f funny by pretending to be dramatic inside a documentary. Yeah, I, I must... I've just suddenly realised I emphasise this. There is one character that you did present in the 21 years of interviews that, that for whom you, you created an uncanny, you know, visual thing. Mm. And that was Peter Garrett. Yes, that's right. Well, Peter, Peter and I have often been mistaken for one another because of our gifts. I was, I was thinking more of your baldness. Oh, I'd never noticed that. But, um, I, must, I must pay more attention. I'll have a look at Peter when I see him. <laughs> when... When did you... How did you pitch this idea 21 years ago to the well, ABC? I, well, television wanted me to do um, something uh, that was sort of satirical and inside a current affairs program, and I was doing... I would do anything at that stage rather than do a monologue because I'd done a lot of monologues. I'd done oodles of them in New Zealand and oodles of them here, principally on radio, which were wonderful, but the, I was trying to... Th think of ways of getting another voice in so that I'd noticed that instinctively I was taking a lot of phone calls inside the monologues and I was talking to the panel operator inside the monologues and things. So I was desperately trying to get an idea that would involve another voice. And um, so I thought, well, I tried doing these interviews and I actually tried them in a newspaper column I had in a, in a now-deceased newspaper called The Times on Sunday um, where I tried the idea out and then um, when I was asked to do some monologues on television, I said, how about I do monologues but with someone else? And they said, technically speaking, that's not exactly what we mean. And I said, I beg your pardon, and have a look at this. Let's have a go at a bit. And when we first did them on television, we did them on Channel 9, and Yana Vent was the host, and she got it. And she very intelligently realised that it is an unusual idea. It's a bit surreal, and so... Her rule was that she didn't want to be shown anything we did until it went to air live, and it was a very sensible decision and an extremely helpful one to us. I'm fascinated at the way comic duos loathe each other, Flanagan and Allen, Lewis and Martin, Abbott and Costello, uh, even Gilbert and Sullivan. And, of course, the same thing applies to you and uh, your collaborator. Yeah, I... Brian, we can't stand each other. Do you ever, do you ever talk 
off, barely. off camera? We no. barely, barely speak. We have this sort of white knuckle arrangement every week where we professionally have to deal with one another, but the sooner we get out of it, the happier we are. What is it about you he finds particularly loathsome, do you think? Um, I think it's probably that he resents um, being told what to do. He res resents any kind of command system. He's essentially an anarchist. And um, I order him round a bit, and I think that, you know, perhaps not unnaturally, it gives him the squirts. We're giving him right of reply. He's coming on later. To, oh, well, I'll leave. To I'm not having anything no, no, to do with not, him. We're not suggesting he should be in the same studio or even mm. in the same city. We've, mm. made, we've, made, we've made other arrangements. I, I I've was, got a contractual problem otherwise. I was always loved this day tonight because it pioneered irreverence in yeah. public affairs television. And, and sadly... You two were the only elements of irreverence that really survived in the in the seven thirty report. It seems to me that your time has come. I mean, after the program, I'll go home and I'll look at I'll look at uh, the Daily Show with with John what's his name and uh, Stuart. John Stewart and the Colbert rapport mm. and uh, and marvel at them. Mm. And yet Australians were into this a long time before the Americans. We really did fiddle with all forms of political irreverence, didn't we? We did, and it's interesting because um, it, it did happen in current affairs shows. It did in New Zealand too. Whereas in Britain and America, they, they encouraged a lot of comedy shows and they encouraged them rather intelligently and they team-built. They put people together, like Monty Python's a, not a group of people who worked together before they were Monty Python. They were two groups. In fact, they were three groups. They were put together by Barry Took um, at the BBC. Um, we don't have a fostering program, so a lot of the humour here, and the satirical humour particularly, has perhaps found its its home because of its association with journalism rather than because of its association with comedy, because, you know, television's idea of comedy was not always um, the idea that people wanted to write. I mean, there were some appalling sitcoms in the 70s and 80s and things, and you'd get asked to write them, but you'd think, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Well, well, John, we have caught up big time with uh, with Chaser and Working Dogs, Working Dog stuff. But mm. it still seems to me that the the two American shows, Colbert and Stewart, are genuinely pr quite profound works of political analysis. The mm. Tivo editing that mm. Stewart uses to open every night's program, really, where mm. he'll contrast the the various, you know paradoxes or nonsenses or contradictions rather in uh, you know in in public statements by a George Bush or a or a McCain or indeed an Obama a revelatory and yet that's the right. whole thing you piss yourself laughing at the same time that's right and they're also interesting because they in in conventional uh, american network context you'd have to have gone for a much broader demographic whereas they can go for a very savvy um, intelligent and knowledgeable subsection of the American audience and A, get it, and B, get its international equivalent simultaneously online. Um, those Tina Fey being Palin interviews, for example, 80% of the people who've seen them did not see them on television. Well, his rating, if you look at Stuart, the actual audience for the show, last time I looked, they go up every time there's a presidential election. The actual audience mm. is about one and a half million. Yeah. But the flow-on impact from those two yeah. programs is simply, well, it's beyond calculation. Yes, that's right. Why don't you do one? Yeah, well, on, on the, the online stuff is very significant in those shows. Oh, well, it would be good to do that. I, th I think that they have got... Um, there are quite a lot of writing. The, the writing is the key to a lot of these things and you need excellent writers and they've got squadrons of them and obviously they're replaceable because the names don't always stay the same. Um, and um, Tina Fey, for example, when she's being Sarah Palin, wouldn't have a problem if she forgot what she was about to say because she's a writer. She'd just make something up and it'd be good. Um, the writing well, in is, her case, of course, she doesn't need to make anything up. She tends no, she to doesn't. She recycle to Palin. Yeah. To remember what Palin said yesterday. Exactly. Um, no, well, that, that's an, an interesting point because um, I think that, that a lot of Australia's humour has come out of a non-fiction rather than a fiction base. 
Have you been this, this bit? We, well, this won't go to where this bit. Uh, have you been approached recently? <laughs> he lied smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have guessed. No, no one's asked you to do one. Do what? To do a pilot, no, to do a steward type. Oh, of no, do a show like that? Yeah. Um, well, not exactly. The the there are proposals all the time floating around for various ideas, and of course that. Um, also has the advantage in terms of cost of being a studio-based sort of desk program. Um, and so it will appeal to um, a lot of people. But I, don't, I wouldn't want to do a show that was sort of based on that. I'd rather do a show that was an original idea. And I oh, God, God forbid that you should. It's just that the times they are changing and they're heading in that direction. And well, and, they and are. And I think, that, you know, if you look at the history of humour, there's an enormous amount of humour in the 30s when times were very tough and the model had fallen over and maybe we're headed for that. Yeah. And, of course, you did create a new genre, although I'm not sure that uh, others would make this connection i think uh, i think the games was a was indispensable in a sense to the office well perhaps but we're all working in a tradition and there are things before the games that are um uh are, you know you you could see some provenance in perhaps yes minister or something and in and in perhaps radio there there's a river of things happening i i agree that you know you, you can see things in the in in the programs that followed that that owe some debt to small discoveries we made or indeed to where the industry was up to at the time because the industry changes all the time the medium that you're on in television is a constantly changing one and for example if you did the games now you'd have quite a lot of onlinery attached to it You'd, you'd, ha you'd be releasing stuff online that would, would not be supposed to have been released online and talking about it in the program and all sorts of other things. You couldn't do that at that time. I um, complain about your lack of prosthetic noses and wigs when you're doing the, uh, the interviews, but when you're, in fact, discovering that almost every great poet was born in Australia, you go to no end of trouble to create to create a local version thereof. Let's just listen to this. This is uh, this fellow seems to bear some relationship to a Welsh fellow called Dylan Thomas. One Christmas was so like another in those years around the sea town corner now that I can never remember whether it was 106 degrees in 1953 or whether it was 103 degrees in 1956. All the Christmases roll into one down the wave-roaring, salt-squinting years of yesterboy. My hand goes into the fridge of imperishable memory and out come salads and sunburn lotions and the brief exuberant hiss of beer being opened and the laugh of wet-haired youths around a Zephyr Six. The smell of insect repellent and eucalyptus and the distant, constant, slowly listless bang of the flywire door. And resting on a formica altar, waiting for Ron, the biggest pav in the world, a magic pav, a cut and come again pav for all the children and all the towns across the wide brown bee humming trout fit sheep rich to horse country. And the ants, always the ants, in the kitchen on the black and white photographed beach of the past, playing out the rope to a shared childhood, caught in the undertow and drifting. And some numerous uncles, wondering occasionally why they want each other, coming around the letterbox to an attacking field in the test match and being driven handsomely by some middle-order nephew, skipping down the vowel-flattening pitch and putting the ball into the tent flaps on the first bouts of puberty. That's, that, that's a wonderful piece of work. Where did you discover this, this particular poet? Well, um, he came from the south coast of Victoria, somewhere in between Port Ferry and Portland, um, and that particular piece is called The Child's Christmas in Warrnambool. I, I imagine that his family used to go to to Warrnambool for its Christmas holidays. and Down, down to the fishing there. boat bobbing sea, probably. <clears throat> down to the fishing boat, yes, indeed. The, the, the black, Slow yeah. black, crow black fishing yeah, yeah. boat, etc. Exactly. <laughs> well, I grew up sort of listening to that and I thought, what a wonderful 
you know the the the, the question in any creative endeavor is is not so much form uh, not so much content as form you need to know what it is that you're going to do you can have an idea but is it an idea for a television show or for a movie or for an article in the paper or I had quite a good one the other day for a phone call to my sister um, so I made it and it went very well um, <laughs> but but you have to understand the form and I was so delighted when I discovered how brilliantly the great poets um, have basically worked out their own form in each case. They all work or else they wouldn't be who they are. And um, his, is, his is fantastic because it's partly narrative and it's partly to do with sort of stacking adjectives in a pile along the <laughs> railway line of the story. Yes. Oh, dear. Coming back to you and uh, your appearance on television and film, I I remember when you came to Australia, you were fleeing from the extraordinary and painful celebrity that Fred Dagg forced on you in New Zealand, and for a while you sort of hid. You absolutely didn't want to be you didn't want to be seen, and yet in a strange way, ever since by going on telly as you, whether it's in the games or whether it's in the uh, you know the twenty one years of catastrophic encounters you don't have a carapace there's nowhere to hide i find this a bit of a dilemma yeah well how do you think i feel i've got no idea quite how to deconstruct this i mean the idea that i was going away from celebrity is a, is is your idea and it's a very generous spirited one and i've often wondered whether i just was doing there's a sort of a there's a there's a system whereby if you want to do anything in the some creative enterprise you you have to get yourself into the position where it's possible to do and then you do it and you do it as well as you can but by the time you're in a position to do it you've got another idea and you're actually doing something you wanted to do 18 months ago and Fred Dagg was an idea that I'd wanted to do when I was at university but it was illegal to be on television when I was at university and I had to wait for the life's ferris wheel to do a couple of circuits before I was allowed to do it then by the time it happened, I had a wonderful time doing it, but, but my creative mind wasn't working on that anymore. It was ahead a, a bit. I didn't know quite what it was doing, but it wasn't going to be happy just doing that. So, so I don't know quite what that was all about psychologically looking back, but, but I do find the business of, of saying that you are someone and not pretending to be that person and undeniably being yourself and what does that mean? I think that's pretty funny. That's sort of that's Beckett. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's to do so with you, so things. you and you and that other bloke that sit on the mm. telly, you're Vladimir and Estragon in a sense. Well, perhaps we are and perhaps we all are. I'm not making a claim that I've got some insight into Beckett or the same insights that Beckett has. We're, obviously that's a ridiculous thing to claim. But I am saying that the observations that lots of people make are similar when they observe the same sorts of things. Beckett and lots of other people, um, Magritte, for example, observes people who are uh, undoubtedly in the right clothing and they're, they're sort of going about their business in a conventional way, but they are facing the wrong way and they're in the sky or they're looking at the back of their own head in a mirror or something. There's something a wee bit skew-whiff, and we recognise that it's a bit skew-whiff because a lots of things are. John, you're wonderfully skew-whiff, and I thank you for it. And please give my best to your um, to your collaborator. I shall do that, although he can't stand you, and he'll probably hit me. I know, I know, but you didn't have to tell the listener that. I'm going to end by um, playing a little bit of one of your impersonations. This one is of Senator Bob Collins, who was at the time Minister for Shipping. It's called The Front Fell Off, and while we enjoy it, John, you can take your leave and hide somewhere. Thank you very much, <laughs> Philip.
John, John Howe. I miss him and I know we all do. Three years since we lost this remarkable human being. Tomorrow, Bruce Shapiro as usual, and we'll be talking to Ben Peters about what we can learn from the Soviet Union's failed internet fiasco. See you then. listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.